Today, we've got some huge breaking news about sourcing in China that you guys are going to want to listen to from one of the world's top experts. And we're also going to find out about sourcing online for those who can't visit China and a lot of other great new tips. How cool is that? Pretty cool, I think. Sellers have lost thousands of dollars by not knowing that they were hijacked, perhaps, on their Amazon listing, or maybe somebody changed their main image, or Amazon changed their shipping dimensions so they had to pay extra money every order. Helium 10 can actually send you a text message or email if any of these things or other critical events happen to your Amazon account. For more information, go to h10.me forward slash alerts. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the Serious Sellers Podcast by Helium 10. I'm your host, Bradley Sutton, and this is the show. That's a completely BS-free, unscripted, and unrehearsed organic conversation about serious strategies for serious sellers of any level in the e-commerce world. And from the almost complete opposite end of the world, I believe 12, 13 hours uh, difference in time zones, we have got Kian back on the show. Now, this is a, hit, a, a momentous occasion because... I have kind of like this written slash unwritten rule. I don't want to have the same, you know, just to make sure we have enough diversity of guests. You can only be on the podcast um, once a year, kind of. And so we've we've now been on 400 episodes. And so this is, Kian is now the first person ever to come back four times on the podcast. That's how long we've been doing this podcast. So Kian, this is, you know, no, no pressure, but, but you're, 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 oh, man, that's, a, that's such an honor, Bradley. And I'm so glad to, to be the first person to appear four times. Uh, I absolutely love it, man. And uh, that's a testament to you as well. 400 episodes. Wow. That's a massive achievement as well. And I'm sure the audience have had so much value for those who've been around from the beginning. So yeah, massive honor. And, uh, yeah, if you're new tuning in for the first time, Hey, what's up? My name is Kian Gozari. Um, I've been living in China, living and working in China for the last like 12 years, although uh, last three years I haven't really been there, but that's about to open up, which we're about to talk about today. Um, and in that time, I've manufactured and sourced over two and a half thousand products, visited more than 500 factories and attended more than 20 real Canton fairs and four virtual Canton fairs. So I'm so excited that the real Canton fair will be back uh, in April as well. That's something that I'm just desperate to get back to. So yeah, looking forward to, to jumping into it with you today and, and sharing uh, some value with the audience. Awesome. Awesome. So if you guys want to, you know, the, that's about the extent of the backstory we'll do because we've covered this before. So we want to hop right into the good stuff. But if you guys do want to, you know, if, if you're new, like, like he said, if you're new to the podcast, maybe you haven't heard his other ones. Uh, Mel was kind enough to write down your episode. So guys, you can check out episode 61 was the first time he was on. And then the other couple times was 179 and 309 as well. We talked about different subjects, but Today, the topic of conversation is is not Tokyo. That's actually the kanji of my I'm shirt here. Uh, I like your it's teacher, about man. China, that, that's, that's actually. That's sick. <laughs> I, think, yeah. I guess went to Japan a few weeks ago. I bought this at the airport. Um, but, I, you know, I did like a mini Asia tour, yeah, as you may or may not know. I think I, what was I? I went to Singapore. I went to Japan. I went to Korea. went to Vietnam for the first time. Uh, I would have gone to China, but, you know, I didn't want to quarantine for weeks or however it was but what's the big news that right here in the first week of january i believe any day now something is changing for foreigners who want yeah, to visit absolutely. so from country. january 8th china is open to foreigners and there's no need for quarantine anymore all you have to do is show a negative uh, pcr test 48 hours before departure so it, it, it it's great because it, as it happens right now uh, china have like opened up properly and you know, they're kind of two years behind the rest of the world because when the rest of the world, every other country uh, massively opened up, there were a huge spike in surge in cases. So that's what's happening in China right now. But if it was me, I'm kind of waiting for uh, Chinese New Year to pass because you, even though it opens up to foreigners on January 8th, like January 25th is Chinese New Year anyway. So the factories are going to be closed and offices are going to be closed as well. So and that's when the Chinese New Year is the biggest people migration in the world. So these cases are going to spike, but it's necessary for them to just open up, get over this, and then it's going to be safe for the rest of the world to travel. So my personal plan um, is to go around end of February, beginning of March. So when those cases have come down, it's safe for us to travel and uh, factories will be reopened as well. What you just said, it deserves this. All right, round of applause because we have been waiting for this, guys, for a long time. Now, now again, 
that, that you know, I didn't even think about that. I, I, I mean, I knew that Chinese New Year's was now, um, or in a few days, because my factory was telling me actually, hey, you know, we're about to we're about to close. But I totally, totally didn't even dawn on me. But um, uh, you know, the, the difference now is something. I forgot what it was, but but what you mentioned about it opening up, it's something like plus three or like I have to be in my hotel for three days, or it's kind of like loose. Like, do you know anything about? What that plus three or three days or something? Uh, yeah, uh, really so means? you just have to show a test. So w w when you're, and th this might change as well, um, closer to the time. But you just you, you can still go mm -hmm. out and roam like you're free, but you have to have a, a a test like every three days. And then if you do take a test and you're positive, then I assume you have to take the necessary precaution. But uh, it, it like ah. so that, that happened in Dubai as well when I first moved here, like they test you at the airport when you arrive and then you're out in the city, you go to your hotel or your apartment, whatever it may be. And then you get the result 24 hours later. And then if your result is negative, then you're just free to do whatever you want to do. But if you're positive, you get a text to say, Hey, you, sh you just, just you should stay in your hotel room. So that's why I assume it'd be like in China as well. But the good news is that if you know you're negative, which you'll know because you have a test before you travel, you're pretty much in there and you're mm -hmm. good to go. So that's super, super exciting. Wow, that's better than I thought because I I was reading it and it almost seemed like I still had to stay in a hotel for three days, but I, I guess not if I'm doing the test. So that's yeah, awesome and, news. and especially after Chinese New Year as well, like this should all really die down in terms of the number of cases. So it will be like super safe to to basically walk around and and, and conduct yeah. our business. And I, I just miss China in general. Like forget the work stuff, but just being in the city and being yeah. in the country and it's like uh, connecting with all the people that we built relationships with, and then. Attending the Canton Fair as well is going to be absolutely huge, game changing for people's business uh, as well. Obviously, it's, it's probably not going to be the same as it was before because probably a lot of people are still getting over this situation. But um, for anyone who doesn't know, the Canton Fair is the biggest import export fair in the world, and it happens in Guangzhou, China. Over twenty six thousand exhibitors over three phases, and it's one of those exhibitions where no matter what product you're looking for, whether it's like pets or baby or sport or food or military or whatever it is, like kitchen electronic. Uh, massage chairs they've got absolutely everything and um they're all there over the canton fair and then you have a uh, hong kong global sources trade show as well in between that as well and it just massively accelerates your business to be somewhere like that like the fact that you can go to a hall and see 50 different suppliers for the product that you're sourcing or that you're selling and you know you can have all those conversations with the product in your hand you can touch and feel the product you can um implement all the changes that you want to do you can negotiate the price you can build a relationship with the supplier and that will really really fast track your development because the sample will be ready based on all the changes that you've asked for before you even leave china sometimes they even just send it to your hotel room within a few days so and a, a lot of people always ask me like well is it not really expensive to go to china if you think of like the cost of a flight ticket let's just say eight hundred to a thousand dollars hotel like okay let's say five hundred mm -hmm to a thousand dollars your food and all that all in your costs maybe about two thousand dollars to go to china for like um 10 days for visiting factories in canton fair but think about for that two thousand dollars you've built let's say five or ten different relationships you've developed five or ten different products you've negotiated the best possible price you can get because face to face you'll get much better prices than you would over like email or alibaba chat or anything like that and then You've also like massively sped up your, your sample development time, but also reduced your sample cost. Because think about when you ask a supplier for a sample and they say, yeah, it'll be $200 the cost of freight. Uh, the courier of the samples will be like $200. You're sending that from multiple suppliers. Imagine you get your sample, something's not right, and then you make your changes. You have to sketch it out in an email. Then they have to remake it. Then they have to resend it. So like you just bypass that entire thing. So I think the people which are serious about going to China, which now we have the opportunity to do, and I would advise kind of going around um, mid-April so you can knock out the Canton Fair and visit your factory at the same time. Uh, because I live in Dubai now and I'm so close, I'm planning to go beginning of March just to do a quick visit, make sure everything's cool, make sure everything's safe, everything's back to normal, and then I'll go back. So What's the airport if I wanted to uh, go there? I've, not, I've actually never been oh, to it's, the Canton it's, Fair. So you can either go to Guangzhou, Shenzhen, or Hong Kong. So... Uh, Hong Kong is okay. probably m most routes, depending if you're traveling from like the US or UK or Europe, uh, most popular uh, routes, probably uh, Hong Kong. Um, they have, I've been looking for flights, but Emirates, like, you know, from Dubai haven't opened up the flights to Guangzhou, China yet. So I'm just kind of waiting for that. But the Canton Fair is in Guangzhou. So if you can fly there, that's G-U-A-N-G-Z-H-O-U. You can fly direct there. Shenzhen is nearby. It's like an hour away by car or by train. So you can also fly into there as well. But Guangzhou would be the favorite. 
l- let's talk some more logistics like that before we get into the the, the nitty gritty because I do I do I do want to keep talking about going there, but um or about about you know the reasons why and what we can do, but just so people understand the logistics, you know, first of all, um, you like are you planning any of those? Or do you know of anyone uh, planning on restarting like a sourcing trip? And then should like somebody wait for that? It's going to come out to be more expensive because everything's arranged and stuff. You know, you like you said, $2,000. But maybe if we're doing a sourcing trip, you know, who knows? It might be $4,000 because you get other things, you know, uh, included, you know, guided tours and things like that. Or should I just, hey, you know what? There's, there's, a, there's a short window of opportunity here where maybe none of my competitors who have started in the last two, three years have ever met face to face with their suppliers. I like have this chance all of a sudden to just get there and be one of the first ones and possibly be one of the first ones to get my, my prices reduced and build these relationships. Like, should I wait for a a guided tour or, or, or should I just go? Great question. I think if, if you know what you're doing and and you're familiar with navigating China and stuff like that, then by all means, just go as soon as possible, Mm -hmm. especially as you said, get, get ahead of your competition because um, the Chinese, suppliers really respect the buyers which come to their place of business right because imagine like you know this canton fair is in like this exhibition center in guangzhou like it's a big city but normally the factories are in these like rural countryside areas so when you go to visit a factory the supplier knows you're not there for a holiday like you're there to do business right you didn't go to this village right to for, for a holiday you're there because you're serious about doing business and they respect that they're like you know what i'm gonna give this person my best, my best service, my best products, my best price, my best attention, because they've come uh, as a matter of respect all the way to come and see me. So there's so many different advantages of going to see yeah. the factory. So I would say if you know what you're doing, by all means, but if you've never been to China before, you definitely need a bit of support because uh, we all make mistakes uh, when, when we're there. Even making mistakes sure. with you know sourcing products, negotiating the price, talking to the manufacturers, what are our expectations and things like that. Um, so I would always advise uh, a trip, and a, a trip that I've been on several times before, uh, COVID was the China magic trip, and I, I would hope that that uh, go- goes up again. I think the only challenge with a sourcing mm-hmm. trip is that normally you would start to plan and arrange things six months in advance prior to going on the trip, right? Whereas we, yeah, you can't really plan anything until after Chinese New Year because there you don't know what the cases, what the situations will be like until mid February. But then that means you can kind of start organizing and selling the trip beginning of March, but then the trip is mid April. So it's like saying, hey come on this trip and it starts in six weeks. So I don't know if people can like take Mm. time off work that far in advance or can make a trip from US to China in such short notice. But whether there's a trip or not, it's essential to get out there. And as you said, like, you know, getting ahead of your competition and actually Bradley, you find this really interesting. I did a test, right? In terms of, so I've got a team on the ground in China. And obviously, we've not been able to go to China. We've been utilizing online resources like Alibaba.com and other websites and stuff like that, right? I took five mm-hmm. random products from five different categories. And when uh, I've got these different accounts on Alibaba, I just wrote a general message, not the way I'd normally write it, but just a general message. Hey, I'm interested in these like notepads or whatever. Um, what's your best price, et cetera, et cetera. And then I got my office in China to contact those suppliers just by phoning them or emailing them and talking like locally in Chinese, the exact same product, same quantity. And the prices that were given to my China office were like between 15 and 20% cheaper than the ones just inquiring by email. And that's not to say that we couldn't negotiate that down and get it down because obviously we can open up the conversations, talk about samples and negotiate that down. But just the initial pricing was so much better from the people which were there face to face or in the country or understood the products. And that's basically a testament to people who want to travel to China will get that level of service and price because they know you're the serious buyer. Because what we also have to consider is that anyone who goes on Alibaba.com and writes to a supplier, right? Those suppliers are probably getting between 50 and 100 inquiries a week, right? And they're trying to really gauge, right? Who are the serious ones? Because people are still doing their research at that stage. They get the price and they're like, you know what? Not interested. Supplier follows up. Hey, do you want to do this product? And they just, they get no replies. So suppliers like get overwhelmed with online inquiries. But when you're there in person, you're like, I'm not here to do anything else apart from the source of product that I'm asking for you, from you, right? So they're going to give you their serious best price best attention so getting out there is is it will be an absolute game changer and anyone who's listening to this and who's been to china knows exactly what we're talking about but if you've never been before and you're sourcing your products from china even if you're sourcing from other countries um 
get out to those countries as well. Like everything that we talked about, the principles remain the same, whether you're sourcing from Myanmar, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, Turkey, Mexico, go and visit those factories as well. Like the benefits are the same. It's just so important to get out there. You know, speaking of all those different countries, actually China, even before COVID was for an American person, at least one of the more difficult countries to get to, you know, not, not quite as difficult as me going to Pakistan, which, which, which took a lot of effort, but you know, Americans, you know, we're kind of spoiled, you know, with our passport, we can go almost anywhere in the world. But I remember, you know, four years ago, three, four years ago was the last time I went to China. I actually had to go, um, since I live not that far from Los Angeles, I, I went to go get, um, visa at the, the embassy or consulate, whatever it's called over there. And I, and I was, you know, I was like planning to go to China a lot. So I got a 10 year visa. However, I heard something that all of those kind of visas, like even if you had a 10 year visa before, like they're kind of null and void now or something. I have to yeah. go get a new one because of COVID. Like, yeah, do you know anything I'm, about I'm, that? I'm in the same boat. Like, so I had a 10 year visa as well. So when, when COVID first hit and China travel to China was blocked, they said, if anyone has got a visa mm-hmm. for China, like, like you said, it's null, like it's, doesn't exist anymore it, it, it's done huh. so but they haven't actually announced yet officially re-entering china now if you have to reapply if you had a visa or if your previous visa is now accepted the only thing and i'm going to do this as well is just check with your local embassy to say like hey here's a photo of my visa it's still valid it's still within the 10 years do i need to reapply for a new one or i i, I would assume that we need to reapply probably because they'll probably be a little bit more strict or controlling in terms of knowing who's coming into the country and things like that and i think that within the last like three years since they've blocked it probably people's like passport numbers have changed and the countries they visited uh, recently have changed so i'm guessing they probably want a little bit more information as well out of people so i would assume that we need to reapply but if they s- decide to reinstate the existing visas then then we're okay but i would always just check with your local uh, embassy um, let's say I'm going to the Canton Fair because for, for maybe a newer person, that's probably the best way to start. Even if I already have a supplier, you know, plan on visiting the supplier, but also go to the Canton Fair. Um, like I think the last time I've only been a couple times to to China. Most of the times I was just along with like a group of people, like like so I didn't have to worry about you know rides and and transportation and things like that. So I'm just wondering for for if I'm new, if I'm listening to this podcast and, and I've never been to to China, but I'm a decent traveler, so I'm gonna go try and do it myself. Um, like you know, I get to the airport. Let's say I go to Guangzhou. You know, how do I get to the Canton Fair? Like you know, train, bus? Uh, is is there an Uber? Is there another app? Like when I went to the Philippines and Vietnam, I had to download this app called a Grab app. There was yeah. no Uber. Um, in, in that country. So like what, what's transportation like in China? Yeah, so I, I guess there's, that's a great question, by the way, because a lot of people can get really um, overwhelmed or they're misled with this. There, there's there's two different transportation things I would consider. One is if you're going to visit your factory and one if you're going to visit the Canton Fair. If you're going to visit your factory, let your factory know when you're coming, what airport you're flying into, and they will arrange everything for you. Every, every factory mm-hmm. I ever went to, they always organize a driver for me. And it's like you literally get out of the airport, they have a sign with your name on it, driver takes you and then they drop you to your hotel they take you to the factory wherever you want to go you want to do some touristy stuff they'll come and meet you they're amazing hosts like they'll take you out for dinner and their hospitality is amazing but if you're going solo you're just going to check out the canton fair for the first time you're not working with any suppliers i de- i would definitely recommend the official taxis which in china they're green um because you know it's one of those countries that you know as soon as we get out of the airport everyone's like taxi 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 and just these like unofficial yeah. cars right i would not suggest that whatsoever um, they do have uh, Chinese apps, not not Uber. The Uber was there when I was living in China, but I don't believe it's there anymore. So there'll be a local Chinese app, which I would just suggest getting when you're when you're on the ground. But just queuing up and getting a normal taxi is fine. And I would say that once you get oh, uh, another thing as well is that always, always, always have your hotel name written in English and in Chinese because ninety nine point nine percent of taxi mm. drivers cannot speak English, so and cannot read English, so. The way I always got around was, first of all, I learned uh, Chinese when I was living there. But second of all, I always had the business card or the name card or a photo uh, of my hotel address in Chinese. And I would just always show that to the taxi driver and know exactly where to go. And if you ever book a hotel uh, on like, you know, booking.com or hotels.com in China, it will always, in the confirmation, give you the address in English and Chinese. Just screenshot that, photo that, always have that on your phone, save, print it out. In emergency, you just need to show that and, and they'll take you to where you need to go. So definitely uh, official taxis and then let your um, 
factory know when you plan to visit as well and they'll arrange drivers for you okay excellent information now um going specifically you know just make believe that i'm definitely going to the canton fair um what's like i know it's massive so like how do i tackle it like, like i i've again i've never been there so i i have no idea like i'm assuming like different sections of the building or different buildings are different uh you know kinds of products you know or something like so should i have something in mind already like hey i want to focus on home goods or, or i need i want to do pet supplies like like is there a you know a kind of map or something beforehand i need to game plan or, or do i just show up and yeah, just start and walking? Also, these are great questions it's bringing back a lot of memories because well it's like, it's like, <laughs> like i genuinely want to know this too because i've never done this so i'm like all our listeners right now i want to i want to know because i literally i don't know maybe, maybe you and i can go together but i I want this year to be the, you know, my, my first year to go to the, well, 100%, the uh, I'll be there. So I'd love to host you if you want to go together and uh, we can document the whole thing. But um, yeah, th that's an amazing question because like when I, because I went to the Canton Fair for the first time in 2010 uh, and I was a little bit overwhelmed and I didn't plan it the first time that I went and you're just kind of like caught in a maze, right? You're just kind of walking around because every hall has got like, let's say 25, 26 different rows and each rows you can walk for like maybe half a kilometer of like different booths so like literally you stop and see something you're like you're there for like half a day and so you really have to plan your trip in terms of so before going to on a china trip i would always say right these are the products which i want to develop as a result of this trip right i've maybe got 15 20 or maybe 50 or 100 different products i'm like after this trip i want to have like have uh, an amazing supplier an amazing sample and my price is negotiated for these products so i would kind of go to the canton fair with that agenda and they do have a map um the the official website i think it's like cantonfair.org or something like that or cantonfair.net or something but i've made like three or four youtube videos uh, on my channel sourcing with kian of the online canton fair which i show you how to navigate it online and then the real canton fair like walking around the booths and stuff like that so if anyone wants prepared for that definitely check out that video uh, on my youtube channel i'll show you what it's like in real life and how it talks to suppliers and things like that but definitely you want to coordinate your trip to be like okay day one we're going for home goods home goods is in hall 8.1 right we want these like kitchen utensils we want this all right day two we're going after our pet products. We want the pet blankets. I can see the suppliers are in this hall. So I can see there's 50 different suppliers there. So I aim to see all of them on day two. And if you know the suppliers in advance, I would book my meetings to say, hey, I'm going to be there uh, day two, 3 p.m. I'll come to your booth. We'll have the meeting or we'll go for lunch together. And any meetings that I wasn't able to fulfill that day, I would always message the supplier and say, hey, can we go out for dinner tonight? And they'll take you out in Guangzhou or come to your hotel or anything like that. But you have to have a plan in terms of the products that you want to develop and source, as well as um, leaving room for new products, which are going to catch your attention as well. Because one of the amazing things about the Canton Fair is that while we all develop new products because we're product developers and innovators, so do our suppliers because our suppliers have been making those products for 20 years and they export it all over the world. So they also have product engineers who are coming out with new stuff. And the Canton Fair is typically where they show those new products. And they don't just have it front and center for everyone to see because their competition are in the booths next to them and the non-serious buyers are also walking past. But when they have the buyers that like, well, they're my customers or I've engaged in a serious conversation with them, I believe that they're actually interested in purchasing from me they'll take out their new products from the back, uh, which are hidden. So I would always say to the suppliers that I find at the Canton Fair, hey, um, what have you been working on in the last year? Or wh what have you got coming out new for 2023? Or what's working in the Brazil market? What's working in the Japanese market? And they're like, oh, hey, you know, you should try this. You should look at this. This is what we've been working on. It's not finished yet, but these are the new features. They're like, oh, sick. And then you kind of get that first mover advantage. And when I'm at the Canton Fair, I'm also negotiating like exclusivity. If I see something new, so if, if we come up with something, you know, we can get a design uh, patent, utility patent, stuff like that and protect ourselves. But if we see something we've never seen before that the factories come up with, I would always ask for an exclusivity agreement to be like, hey, can you give me exclusivity on this for one year or for six months? And they might be like, or they might say, you know what, for you to have exclusivity, you need to order at least 10,000 units. So like, okay, over six months, I'll order 10,000 units. If I don't order that 10K after six months, then you can open it up to the wider market. And they're like, cool. Or they might say, no, this is a brand new product. There's no way we can give you exclusivity because we have many customers interested in buying this. Then I would say, well, can you give me exclusivity for a region? Are you selling in Germany? No. Okay, don't sell to anyone else in Germany. Let me have this for Germany for one year. And then after that, um, you can open up. You're like, cool. So I, I would say negotiate exclusivity agreements for any new product that you see at the Canton Fair. And 
you know, it's, it's Bradley, something you mentioned as well is that like, you know, you might have a product that you're already sourcing. Maybe you find your supplier on Alibaba like two years ago, you've ne never been to China before and you're quite happy. You know, the, the sample's great. The communication's been great. You're happy with the price. But one thing I've noticed a lot in this industry, having like, you've been speaking at Amazon events for four or five years now, is that a lot of people outgrow their supplier meaning when you first placed your order you went on alibaba.com you only wanted to order 300 pieces the bigger factories weren't paying attention to you it was a smaller factory which worked with you gave you the price and you've grown your business and now you're doing like 2,000 units a month but you've always been very loyal to that supplier but you've never tested to say like you know what are there bigger and better suppliers out there for me are the ones which have um better production lines that are faster in production that have got better quality certificates that have got better machinery that have better economies of scale because the supply of walmart and disney and guys like that so i would always the canton fair is a perfect example to take your products with you that you're already buying and say hey this is my current product are you what price would you be able to give me for this for the quantity of twelve thousand units per year or per quarter or something like that and then you'll get the real price. And then I wouldn't necessarily just burn bridges with your existing supplier. Be like, okay, these guys are cheaper. I'm going to start ordering from you now. I would go back to your existing supplier and say, hey, you know, you've been selling this to me for like $7.20. Love working for you. Service is amazing. Quality is great. But at the Canton Fair, they're offering me this for $6.70. It's a 50 cent saving. Like, are you able to match it? Yeah, cool. We can match it. Cool. Well, now you've just got 50 cent saving. Or if they say, no, sorry, we can't match it, then you're like, well, sorry, I need to go with these guys because they're much more capable of handling my current um, supply chain, but I'm still going to work with you in future for any new items and things like that. So this really gives you a good bird's eye view of where you're at in your business, where you can potentially grow, where you can save some price, where you can improve quality, and you can do it all in like a few days on a fun trip. And it's a tax deductible expense as well, right? It feels like a holiday. Now, you know, I've been to the Global Sources a couple of times uh, in Hong Kong. I know that's a lot smaller than the Canton Fair. And I remember, like, going there and, and like, so many of the booths look identical. Like, like, these were in the days when I was doing, like, phone cases and stuff like that. And there would just be, like, rows and rows of booths. And it's, like, at least to my naked eye, there's, like, no distinguishing. But like you said, once you get, like, stopped at a place, like, you could, like, literally just, like, you know, spend, like, an hour there looking through stuff or talking. So do you have any tips as far as, like, hey – how do I make sure I, I, the one that I do stop at, like, is there anything that I can distinguish about how one booth or one company might be better than the other or things I can look for? Is it kind of oh, hit man. or miss? Brother, I think you're on fire today. These questions are, are, are wicked. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. Buttering me up, trying to become the first person to be five times on the podcast <laughs> early, I guess. Huh? All right. No, but because this is another thing, right? That like having walked so many of these exhibitions, the only way you know is just by going and talking to them. And I would say that the, the quality of your questions determine the quality of your results. So I would always, uh, well, I, I know it in my head now, but like when I was younger, I would always just in my notepad have the questions that I wanted to ask the factories, such as um, what factory certificates do you have? What audits do you have? What on the products, what certifications do you have? Um, how many years have you been in business? Where's your factory located? Who is your biggest um, market that you export to? Is it North America? Is it Europe? And this is important because like, you know, if it's North America and you're also selling in North America, then they're familiar with the quality standards of your country. But if 100% of their exports go to Africa, then they have different regulations. So they're not going to be familiar with the regulations that you want. And then I would always ask, you know, within your biggest market, who's your biggest customer? So if it's an outdoor brand and they're like, yeah, 80% of our exports go to North America. I'm like, who's your biggest customer? They'll say North Face. What products do you use for North Face? This one here. Do you have the certificates? Cool. So and they actually like that you're asking these questions because these are the great questions to be asking. So then they respect you as a buyer to be like, this guy clearly knows what he's talking about. And you can also use the booths to um, build up your knowledge as well. So let's say, for example, you're doing an outdoor furniture camping chair, right? And you go into a booth that you're like, you know what? I just don't like the look of this supplier. Like, I'm, I'm not going to work with them, but I need to build up my knowledge about this product before I go to find factories I do want to work with. So I'd be in the booth and I would sit on the chair and I'd be like, you know what? Is this polyester material or is this nylon? They're like, oh, that's polyester. All right, well, what's the difference between polyester and nylon? They're like, you know, polyester is a little bit cheaper. It's a little bit more rugged. Nylon's like tougher and lighter, but a little bit more expensive. How much more expensive? About 15% more expensive. Cool. And do customers in North America normally have waterproof coating on it? Yeah, they normally have like two-layer coating. Uh, if it's in a colder climate or in California, they don't do it. All right, cool. What about the, the tubing? Is it steel or is it aluminum? Oh, is it steel? Oh, yeah, steel's a little bit more expensive than it's thicker, but if you want it lighter, 
um then go for aluminium you know if you're solo camping go for the aluminium one but if you're putting your stuff in in your truck go for the steel one because the weight doesn't matter cool what's the thickness of it and then i'm writing all these things down and then when i find a factory that i do want to work with the guy which is half asleep in his booth i'm like right I need this chair. It's going to be 40 by 60 centimeters. It's going to be nylon fabric. Has to have this trimming. Has to have this waterproof coating. Must be aluminum tubing. This is the thickness of the aluminum. And this supplier is like, wow, this guy knows what he's talking about. I'm not going to bullshit him. I'm going to give him the best price. I'm going to give him the best service. I want this guy as a customer. But if you're asking those questions, then to the factory you want to work with, they can kind of see that you're a newbie and they'll still work with you, obviously, but they can inflate their price and they won't take you as seriously. So I would utilize the Canton Fair to learn as much as you can about the products and then find a factory you want to work with. And then you're just going to have their respect from day one and get the best price and best service. Now, you know, something something that, you know, I've been doing more, you know, 2023 on the podcast, my, my theme kind of is, is like, you know, mental health, physical health, you know, due, due to things that happened to me last year and, and, and like hobbies and stuff. Cause, cause I think as entrepreneurs, you know, sometimes we get in ruts and, and we get stressed out a lot. Um, and so it's important to have these things in mind. We let ourselves, our, let our bodies go and stuff. So I've been asking a guest for this year, like what, what is some of your habits that, you know, number one, like what, what's your hobby that you do to kind of like escape outside of the entrepreneurial world? Um, and is there any kind of like exercise routine that you're doing or or diet routine because you've always been fit from what i know you so like obviously you're doing so you know hopefully you're not one of those person who just has perfect genes and just can eat whatever and drink whatever you want and never gain weight but i'm assuming you 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 have some kind of a routine yeah yeah for sure and that's a great question as well especially going into 2023 i am i always treat fitness as a priority because i've noticed in life when whenever i've been really happy i've always been in shape and whenever i've been like a little bit down or upset or not in the best of moods it's when i've been out of shape and there's a direct correlation between like like healthy mind, healthy body. So uh, I, I actually have something called the workout calendar where oh, I've got a spreadsheet on my desktop, which is open all the time. And I plan my workouts for the week, whether it would just be like going for a swim on the beach or playing basketball with my friends or going to the gym. And I plan it out day by day. And I just make sure every day I hit, and I put it into my calendar as well, right? Because we do calls, we're doing this podcast, this podcast is in both of our calendars, but if, if it's not in your calendar, you can easily miss it. So I know what workout I'm going to do every day and I put it in my calendar. So it's a non-negotiable, like, so I can't do the call at that time because I've got my workout at that time. So uh, I would always just say like, plan your workouts in advance. And then if you're, if you're like me, that like workouts play a lot in terms of like your, your happiness and mental health, then it, it's a non-negotiable. So I would just say plan it in advance. All right. Now, you know, th this is great. And, and I think I, I highly suggest everybody as many as people, you know, visit China if possible. But at the end of the day, being realistic, as far as our listeners go or Amazon sellers out there, probably a very small percentage, you know, have the means and the time and everything to actually do it. So for everybody else, what are some strategies you can give us about online sourcing in China? You know, like is the the online Canton Fair still a thing? You talked about that in a previous episode. Um, can you give us some new New tips about using Alibaba.com, uh, you know, is 1688 still something that, that we should be looking at? What are some, uh, we actually call them now, instead of 30 second tips, we call them 60 second tips now. So what are some 60 second tips about uh, sourcing online in China that you can help us out with? Yeah, for sure. So I would say definitely still utilize the online Canton Fair. Uh, the online Canton Fair, like the usability, the online interface is not as good as Alibaba.com. The suppliers are just different. Um, so I would utilize both. My starting point would always be Alibaba.com just because there's very good suppliers there. There's also very bad suppliers there, but you also you just have to have the right filtering process. And I think Bradley in previous episodes, which are going to be linked below, we've kind of talked over the strategies in terms of mm -hmm. how to find the best suppliers there. So I'd always utilize Alibaba.com. I would utilize the online Canton Fair website. I would even use websites like you know Global Sources just because they offer something different because everyone is kind of going to Alibaba.com, but sometimes you might find a supplier which only lists on GlobalSources.com. So you might have have access to different products, different suppliers, different materials, things like that. What I was also going to suggest was, you know, previously we've talked about, you know, using WeChat and building up your relationship and stuff like that. There's a new mm -hmm. app that all the cool kids are using in China and it's called Ding Talk, D-I-N-G, Ding. So if you download an app and, and you mm -hmm. know what, a lot of people have had a nightmare with WeChat. They're like, you know, I need to get verified and I need a friend to submit authentication. All this very complicated, but just get an app called Ding Talk. Uh, it's like a blue logo with a little like, falcon or eagle on it or something like that and um 
that's owned by Alibaba, whereas WeChat is owned by a company called Tencent, which is the competitor to Alibaba. Mm -hmm. And uh, all the suppliers are using ThingTalk. The usability is so much easier. You can send documents, send files, voice notes, video calls, way more organized, easier to use. All your suppliers are on it. Uh, so definitely utilize that. It's much better than WeChat. And it's got over 500 million users. And WeChat's got wow. around a billion users. So it's already well adopted in China. Uh, so if you talk to your suppliers, just say, hey, what's your DingTalk? And then um, <laughs> it sounds a bit dodgy, but just ask them for, <laughs> for their thing. I, I think he's like pulling up. Uh, I, I think he's, yeah. uh, he's punking us. <laughs> Guys, here, we're going to get punched in the face <laughs> when we go over there. So, yeah. All right. I love it. Yeah. Um, I know you've been doing stuff with Alibaba.com um, and, and, and things like what what's new that you can report? I, I remember the last time or, or maybe two times ago you were on the show and you were giving us some good tips as far as, hey, you know, trying to get at least this many years yeah. of, you know, that they've been and, and here's a good filter to use and stuff. But yeah. but has there been any kind of uh, developments on Alibaba.com yeah. uh, that you could, you know, tell people to utilize? Yeah. The, the, th the thing I say about Alibaba.com is it's constantly improving and I'm uh, doing some work with them in terms of like giving them advice in terms of like how I would like to see the platform improve and things like that. And everyone in the team is like really cool. We went to the office in New York and actually Helium 10 were there as well. And uh, we did some content together. So ever, ever, and they also sponsored Sell and Scale as well, right? So uh, if everyone in the team at Alibaba.com is really cool. And um, they, all I can say is that there's a lot of new updates coming. And, you know, e even things like, you know, on Alibaba.com, you get trade assurance to make sure your payments are protected and things like that. Even that is improving the way that we pay our suppliers, the payment protection that we get, the speed of payments, the cost of online transactions, all of that is improving. Plus the user interface, like even every time I log into the website, there's little updates here and there. Um, I've made some suggestions which they're going to take on board so I'm excited for that to, to come out as well but I would definitely uh, utilize Alibaba.com and I've got a couple of videos uh, on it how to use it on my YouTube channel as well uh, so yeah you can't go wrong there Awesome Be before we get the links to, to you know how people can reach you and stuff one last question for you very important uh, 2023 speaking of travel 100% um, sure I am taking my family sometime this year to Scotland for the first time so tell me some, a couple go-to places, like maybe it's a restaurant or maybe it's a, I mean, obviously I'm going to go to the castle uh, over there, but just like, what is something I need to do when I go to Scotland? For sure. So a, a few things, especially if you're going for family, uh, JK Rowling, the author of Harry Potter is from Edinburgh. Mm -hmm. And um, what a lot of people don't know is that like she wrote the first Harry Potter book in a lot of different coffee shops in Edinburgh. And it, I know I can tell you what those coffee shops are. And then outside the coffee shop, they have the plaque to be like, J.K. Rowling wrote the first chapters of Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone in this coffee shop. And a lot of writers go oh, there. Wow. It's a really good aura and vibe because, uh, you know, you have that uh, feeling. But then apart from that, I would say if you can go in August, you will get to experience the Edinburgh Festival, the Fringe Festival, which is the biggest comedy and arts festival in the world. And the city just okay. like turns out for it. Like it's, it's an amazing experience. Um, the weather is amazing. If you're into the outdoors and you like hiking as well, we have like the best mountains in the world, the freshest air in the world, the best views in the world. If you're into whiskey, we have the best whiskey and distilleries uh, in, in the world as well. So I would definitely do like a little whiskey tour in the highlands and uh, maybe do a bit of hiking, do a bit of camping. And obviously, it's like I started off in camping and outdoors. So I've got all the gear. If you want yep, to do any yeah. camping trips, I'll, I'll hook you up for a nice tent, sleeping bag, furniture, chairs, all that sort of stuff. If you want to do like single day camping or overnight camping or whatever, I've got all the gear for you, camp beds, all that sort of stuff. Um, and then, yeah, apart from that, I know you're into sport, so I'll try and watch uh, football or you guys call it soccer, soccer game, which uh, Celtic and Rangers mm -hmm. are two of the most like famous teams there. Yep, definitely yep. check that out. Uh, that, that, that's a wild experience. And uh, yeah, j definitely check out Edinburgh and Glasgow and then the Highlands up north as well. And uh, I'll, I'll definitely write a few recommendations for you as well prior to you going, but couldn't recommend it highly enough. It's one of the best countries in the world. Um, how can people find your YouTube channel? How can they reach out to you uh, for more information? Um, g give us your interweb uh, locations out there. For sure. So something exciting I did in 2022 is I recorded uh, two courses with a company called Founder, uh, F-O-U-N-D-R. And uh, one of them filmed in Australia, the other one filmed in LA. The first one was a product development course, which was released a month ago. So kind of like everything I've learned in product development over the last year. And Bradley, you actually feature on the website because um, on, on my own website, sourcingofkian.com, I, I took a testimonial from you, I think from the first podcast that we did. And then they've, they put your image and testimonial on that founder website. But if you go to founder.com forward slash Kian, there's my pr uh, product development course there. Uh, apart from that, YouTube and 
Facebook, Sourcing with Kian. I'm also on LinkedIn, just Kian Gozari. Instagram, Kian underscore JG, which I've got big plans for making a lot of content in 2023. Similar to that workout calendar, I've got a content calendar as well. And I've, I'm, I'm going to go nuts this year. So uh, there's going to probably some of the stuff we talked about today is definitely going to get clipped up as well. So uh, yeah, definitely check out the IG, Kian underscore JG, and uh, the website, sourcingwithkian.com as well. I love it. Well, um, like I said, you know, hopefully we can travel together sometime this year. You know, uh, we've linked up in all over the world, you know, <laughs> Dubai, we've linked up in other places. But uh, uh, so far this year, um, definitely go, want to go to China. Um, I'm doing um, a trip I'm going to be announcing in a week or two, like to uh, Bali. I've never been to Bali. So there's going to be like an Amazon um, getaway over there. So, you know, maybe we'll see each other there. But anyways, uh, it was great catching up and um, hard to believe you. It's been four years since we've been doing this uh podcast almost but but i appreciate you all always bring a lot of uh, knowledge every time you come on so thanks a lot keenan we'll be seeing you soon 